Welcome to 39 Minute Conversations. Please wait for your host to begin this meeting. Your meeting is now being recorded. Okay. Are you there? Can you see me? Can you hear me? Yes. Can you see and hear me? I can do both. Perfect. Wonderful. Oh. Um, thank you for being here. Before I get started, I do have to read a quick ad. I hope that's okay. If you can sit tight through that for a second. I'll do my best. I appreciate that. This episode of 39 Minute Conversations is presented by Tim Arnold, Myrtle Beach Realtor. Look, y'all, this podcast has been on the air since November. It's now almost February. That's three months, 13 episodes, and several times we have featured Tim Arnold, Myrtle Beach Realtor, as my only actual sponsor to this point. But we are in serious danger of losing this sponsorship. Sure, yeah, he's my dad, but he's also a businessman, and he expects results. Results that, frankly... He's not seeing. For some reason, my listeners have not yet jumped on the opportunity to buy property in Myrtle Beach, South Carolina. Myrtle Beach is great. I've been going since I was a kid. It's where I first dipped my toe into trying to write professionally. It's where I took my first improv classes. There are so many golf courses, quirky, fun little mini golf courses, nightlife, great restaurants, nothing like a chill day on the beach. So here's the thing. I want to keep my dad as a sponsor. I want to keep my family happy and together. And I want my parents, most of all, to think that I'm successful and that I know what I'm doing. And you can help with that. If you're interested in buying a beach house or a condo in or around Myrtle Beach, contact Tim Arnold at timbeachrealtor at gmail.com. And hey, if you're not interested, that's fine too. Just maybe lead him on a little bit. Tell him you heard about him on 39-Minute Conversations. Tell him he should be proud of his son. That, that, that would be nice. So that's Tim Arnold at timbeachrealtor at gmail.com. And then we pause so the show right. can start. And right. hello, I'm Brian T. Arnold, and this is 39 Minute Conversations, a podcast about reconnecting with old friends and making new ones. But I've only got 39 minutes to do it because I will not be paying for Zoom Pro. <laughs> this is the final episode of my Blacklist series where I've been interviewing writers featured on the 2022 Blacklist, the annual list of the best unproduced feature screenplays of the year. My guest today wrote Breakpoint, which is described as courted by colleges and sponsors alike a burnt out tennis prodigy fights to maintain dominance against her uh, academy rival as she hurdles toward the existential decision of turning pro a choice that will force her to double down on her dream or walk away from the future she's fought for he also wrote and directed the short film school night which played at the austin film festival and the san diego international film festival and is currently available to watch on vimeo ladies and gentlemen everybody please welcome zachary joel johnson Thank you. Thank you, Brian. I don't know how we can follow up that ad read, though. I feel like that was so heartfelt, and there's mm -hmm. a lot to unpack from that ad read. Oh, with, yeah? With you and your father. You know, I feel like maybe that's what that's this what session... Should, that's what this right, whole thing right, right, right. Okay. Right. I'll just, in, you know, inquire about <laughs> y'all's relationship. We'll just we actually have a... It. We actually have a very good relationship. It's just more fun to pretend like it's not, and that uh, he actually and he'll listen to this podcast and he'll be like, "Good, let them know that I'm upset with you." Um, right, 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 yeah. right. Got to so keep you on your toes, exactly. So to speak, exactly. Um, <laughs> Zach, we right. met. We met just <laughs> once, I think, in the pre-pandemic. We had right. we have a mutual friend, uh, John Wickstrom, who was on the blacklist yes. a few years ago. Is, yes. In my writer's group, we met at a birthday party of his, chit-chatted, uh, but it was a few years before we talked again. You recently joined my writer's group, and we're very excited to have you in it. But I feel, I, I'm glad to hear that. But uh, but this conversation, I think, is where we're really going to become uh, best friends, I feel like. Yeah, hopefully it'll be a little bit flirtier than your conversation with Kevin. I know you guys mm. talked about how that was a very flirty episode. But it felt like it. It felt I'm, like I'm it. Hoping, I'm hoping to beat that one if, okay. if possible well, so i think that we've we've circled one another for a while even mm -hmm. though we haven't um known each other well right but so you know just to plug the myrtle beach thing mm -hmm. i grew up in myrtle beach i know i have questions years. about that let's get let's right? get straight into it so we circled each other there we must have and, uh you know i so so i feel like in some ways fates intertwined destined mm -hmm 
to end up here on your podcast. I think that's true. So let's get into let's get into the really getting to know each other and the flirtation and all of it. <laughs> would you would you call John your best friend? <laughs> yes. What would yes, it would. take for me to surpass him in that role? You know, it's tough. You know, the thing about John and I is that we bonded when we painted each other blue mm. for an avatar spoof. Mm -hmm. You know, it's just one of those things where, you know, you really get to know someone well if you paint them. Mm. So maybe if we paint each other, mm. we, we, I'm you know, open. I get close. Yeah. I'm open. Yeah. But I, I don't know. I feel like we have to find our own thing that even gets a little bit more intimate than painting our bodies together. We'll figure well, it we, out. Well, we both worked at movie theaters we right? did so we, did. we can bond over that and you know what you worked at a movie theater that was only 10 minutes away from the movie theater I worked at yeah and we when, didn't even know each other we did not when when did you work you worked at the the what at the the grand not the grand you worked at the mall it was right Broadway Coastal 16. Grand no Broadway no, no, no. yeah that was it was old okay they didn't even have stadium seating man this this theater was old it's it is now demolished it's been turned into some sort of restaurant, oh, but no. I was there, I was working there in, what was it? 2008, 2007. Mm -hmm. Okay. Know. I was a little after you. I, I went there after college. I went down to Myrtle beach. My parents were planning to retire to Myrtle beach and they hadn't moved down yet, but they had bought a condo to eventually move down to and to visit. So I had just graduated from college. I didn't know what I was doing yet. So I was like, Oh, screw it. I'm going to go live in this <laughs> condo that's empty um, for a while. So I, um, and I got a job at, at the movie theater, the Grand 14, which as far as I know, still exists. Uh, it is still there. Great. Great. Um, yeah, it was there. It was there. I don't know why, why I put that precursor on there. Cause I was there in Myrtle beach last year and it would have had to, something bad would have had to happen for it to already right. not exist. Meteor um, strike. And you know, that was, I was trying to write, you know, I had, I was trying to have put off like finding a real job and starting a career on the East coast. Cause I knew I wanted to write, but I didn't know how to start. So I was watching movies for free and filling up popcorn buckets and cleaning theaters and, and going home and writing and taking my first improv <laughs> classes in, in Myrtle beach. Right. You know, the best thing about working in a movie theater in South Carolina is it sort of, it sort of humbles you to the sort of whole glamour of, uh, of the business. <laughs> you know, when you, when you clean up a theater and find mm -hmm. a popcorn bucket with a used diaper in it, you say to yourself, <laughs> okay, that's the destination. That's what we're, <laughs> that's where, that's where our writing is destined for is, um, you know, it's... somebody to watch it, change the baby's diaper, put yeah. it in a popcorn bucket and leave it for the cleanup crew. It's also just a funny view into um, like, I think, you know, we live in Los Angeles, we, li we live in our bubble of like, oh, these stories are really great and matter and important and like, though the indie movies are the best movies and there's a good audience for them here. But I went to, I was in Myrtle Beach last year, my dad had surgery, I was there uh, helping out for a little while. And I was, I was there for two months and it was really hard. And there's one day I was just like, I need to get out of here for a little bit. <laughs> um, so I went to a different movie theater. It was like, it's like in North Myrtle. It wasn't even like, it barely exists anymore, I think. Uh, but I was like, I need to see, I need to see everything everywhere all at once. Everybody is talking about it. I'm, I probably won't be crowded in Myrtle beach. Uh, and nobody, nobody in that town <laughs> saw that movie, right. but it's obviously, you know, a huge hit for what it is and, and all these Academy award nominations and things, which I'm very excited about. I love that movie, but you go somewhere that's not New York or LA, the theaters get a little bit sparser for movies like that. Man, I, it's so true. I have so many memories of like, I also did, I, I sold tickets and I remember I was there when Wally -E came out and this mm -hmm. woman came out at the theater during Wally -E and came up to me and was like, I want my money back. And I said, why? <laughs> and she said, there ain't no talking in it. <laughs> I was like, okay, well, so, you know, it's just funny uh, to get uh, different perspectives. I, I won't harp on it too long, but what was the most embarrassing thing you ever did when you worked at the movie theater? Because I have an embarrassing story. That you, I have, you have an embarrassing story. I can't, I, I can't think of anything. <laughs> There's one story that is too long to tell and involves like, um, uh, I was accused of like espionage trying to get the manager job. And I was like, I really don't care that much to take to get a manager <laughs> job at this, you know, it was a whole thing that involved other people. So I don't want to like 
sure, put their sure. stories on blast. But that's like, that's why I quit and left. It was like this really weird, like oh jockeying for power at this like small <laughs> little <laughs> movie theater. Uh, but you sound like you have a good story. I want to hear, I want to hear yours. I love this espionage, Brian, though. This is, this is another side of you. Even, <laughs> if, it, even if it was fake news, I, I still... We I can like talk it. about it off off mic, sure, uh, sure. but I don't. Yeah, I don't want to tell somebody else's story on on here uh, to that degree. But I would love to hear your okay. real your quick. Story. My my quick story. So I was also I was a projectionist for some time there, and um, it was like there were some thirty five millimeter projectors, but most of them were digital. So you would just load the file up onto the projector and play it that way. So there was supposed to be a screening of G Force, you know, the incredible hamster spy movie. Of course. And so it was Speaking filled of with espionage. Yeah. Yes. Right. Perfect segue. So there was families, kids in there. And <laughs> instead of playing G-Force, I queued up the movie Bruno, Sasha Baron Cohen's movie Bruno, <laughs> played it. It took until like within the first 10 minutes, you know, there's sort of sex scene, sex play. It took okay. until then for anybody to come out and complain. <laughs> <laughs> I can't say that I... I don't think I didn't see either movie. So I but I think I would have been able to distinguish between <laughs> between the two. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Obviously, uh, that was uh, that was crazy times. But um, anyways, very formative years. Yeah. Uh, came out here in 2013. Hold so on. So almost... let's slow, let's slow that roll a second. Yeah. I want okay. I don't want to leave Myrtle Beach yet. Okay. Um, you know, as we've sort of talked about, it's not known as this arts or film capital. Um but, you know, you come from there. How did your family react when you said, no, I'm going to study film. I'm going to be a writer director. You know, um, I got to give them credit. They were they were really supportive from the very get go. My dad is a classical musician. So he grew up. I grew up around the arts. Mm -hmm. You know, he plays piano, classical piano, classical guitar. Um, you know, so there was already like a strong respect for the arts That's nice. in the house. Yeah. My grandparents ran a community theater in Georgia. So um, that's sort of where a lot of my love for story came from was there. Uh, obviously, a lot of like, it's funny to hear Shakespeare with Southern drawls. But, um, <laughs> but, you know, that was sort of the inception point for me in terms of being like, I'm really intrigued in this. And I want to mm -hmm. dig deeper into you know, so theater was my entry point, And then I switched over to film through like a broadcast journalism class in high school. Mm, but okay. yeah, my, but yeah, my parents were um, super supportive the whole way. And I, I really have to give them a major shout out for that. Well, that's great. Yeah, I, my parents were the same way. It was, I think, the kind of thing of like, you know, we don't totally understand it. But yeah, go try, which was very lovely and more supportive than I think a lot of people get, especially where we're from. Um, was there like a movie or a show that first inspired you to like, oh, this is what I want to do with it's even like after theater, after the broadcast journalism thing, or even formatively before that, is there a movie that like woke you up to like, this is what I want to do? Right. I mean, you know, not to be like too traditional, but I mean, Lord of the Rings like blew my mind. Mm -hmm. So, you know, uh, I remember seeing Fellowship of the Ring and theaters and just being like, wow, this is possible, you know, in terms of seeing fantasy that could be done, uh, you know, with that much of sort of a dramatic heft to it. And mm -hmm. it wasn't just silly. Uh, you know, don't get me wrong. I love Dragonheart, love <laughs> Willow, but sure, sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Lord of the Rings just, it did something to me. It rewired my brain. Um, so I would say that that was what kickstarted a lot of the love for film. And then, and then, you know, Shrek 2 carried the torch from there. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Very, very related. Um, right, both, right. Both, yeah, both fairy tale ish lands with, with magical creatures. Thank I get you. It. I can thank see you it. For, thank you for running with me on that uh, one. Dude, I, I took improv for six years. All yes and anything. <laughs> um, <laughs> what was it for you? What was the movie for you that did? I, I had a couple different ones that like changed me in different ways. I remember. X-Men, I grew up in the X-Men cartoon. When I saw X-Men when I was like 12 or 13, whenever that came out, it like, oh man, I got to write stuff like this. I love this. I could, I could write movies. This could be my life. And I tried to write X-Men too at that age. Um, you know, wrote a full script, mailed it to Fox, didn't hear back. Very rude. <laughs> it's still there. Probably. Just, saying, yeah. just hanging out. Um, and then 
I started, you know, as I got older, I, I started kind of getting into the more like, oh, I should try like these indie movies. I got into like Kevin Smith stuff. I got into, I think Garden State is the movie that like I made my parents drive me to like 45 minutes away. Oh, yeah. oh, and yeah. I was just the right age to be like, this is changed. This has changed my life. These are the kind of movies that I want to do forever. And, um, you know, I think some people would say that movie has an age. Well, I haven't watched it in a while. But at that time, in that moment, it was it was it blew me away a little bit, you know? Yeah, I mean, I feel like that really sort of kickstarted a lot of the sort of early aughts, mid aughts, sort of quirky tone, Fox Searchlight, you know, like after that, there was what, Juno and Little Miss Sunshine, you know, things mm -hmm. that were, yeah, and I do feel like Garden State kind of kicked off a lot of that type of, uh, I don't know, yeah, it, it sort of encapsulates that time period. I haven't watched it in a while either, but I remember being really impressed by it too. One thing that we apparently have in common that I didn't know we had in common, just that you have revealed, is you broadcast journalism was your sort of your switch over to yeah. like getting into film. I also took broadcast. I, I knew I wanted to be a writer, but it was for me, like I didn't know how to approach it. I didn't. I was very scared to come to LA, growing up in a small town. Um, I majored in broadcast journalism at a at a. Oh really? I did. Oh, amazing at a school in West Virginia. And then I actually worked as a, as a news producer for a little while after the movie theater and then realized that I hated it and had to, <laughs> and had to actually pursue film. And that was what I wanted to do. Right. Did, and you, but you went, so broadcast journalism in, in high school turned you on to it, but you went to film school at Florida state. So you went I straight did. into film. Okay. I did, but you know, I always, I always really enjoyed the broadcast journalism. I remember doing in, you know, in high school, you know, you're the anchor of like the new show and in, mm -hmm. in the school, whatever. Um, but you know what, Brian, this makes so much sense because I remember my first introduction to you was not meeting you, but was reading your script, Friend of the Show. Yeah. Which yeah. I thought it's was- place in a broadcast journalism world. Yeah. Which I thought was fucking incredible. And oh, I remember because- I had applied to that same competition year with the launch pad mm -hmm. and did not place. And I remember <laughs> being like all salty and I'm like, who's this winner? Who, who, who did they pick to win this thing? And I read it and I was like, well, okay, this is, uh, this is really, this is really good. So I guess I'll just. Well, I appreciate that. Um, but you know, that, that speaks to the fact that we're, you know, all on our own timelines a little bit in terms of, you know, I played, I, I entered a bunch of contests I didn't win. And then, yeah. <laughs> and then finally did uh, with a different script years later. And you, you know, you were salty that you didn't place in this one contest. And this year, you find yourself on the blacklist. How did, how did that feel to go, you know, to, was this a goal of yours? Um, and how did it feel the morning that you found out? Yeah, obviously, you know, every writer who streamed end up on the blacklist. I think, um, you know, the, the, these past 10 years in Los Angeles, I've read, I, you know, I always looked forward to the list coming out. I would always read scripts off of it, would always try to plug myself into the discourse about, you know, what made it, what didn't. Um, you know, in terms of uh, the in terms of the morning of, I don't think I had slept much the night before. I, I had I had some vague sense that we had a shot of getting on. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, there's just there's never any promises. There's never any guarantee. So I didn't I hadn't slept much. So I was just sort of uh, cuddling with my cat the morning of uh, too scared to look at the uh, blacklist <laughs> Instagram handle. But um, no, I mean, obviously, it was, uh, you know, really affirming. And, and, you know, I think as writers, we're always sort of looking for some sort of like, video game checkpoint. <laughs> Sure. You know, to feel like, oh, yeah, okay, it. finally reached this level and mm -hmm. here's something they can't take away type of thing. And mm -hmm. um, so that that was what it was for me. That's what it meant for me. Yeah. Uh, um, has anything, have you, has that script been optioned yet or have you had good meetings on it? Or yeah, a lot of good meetings. Yeah. A lot of good meetings, not optioned yet. I, you know, part of the, uh, part of the struggle with it is, you know, I want to direct it. And I think sure. that that's something that is just, it's tricky to find the right fit, the right match, um, mm -hmm. because I don't have any uh, feature credits as a director. I've directed short films. So, you know, it's just, um, it's trying to, trying to find the right fit and trying mm -hmm. to, you know, get this thing, get this thing launched off the catapult, so to speak. And the blacklist um, can only help with that. Like it's, it's, it uh, is. I, yeah, which is great. It's very exciting. I, 
congratulations if I didn't say it. It's very, it's very exciting. It's very cool. Um, it's something that you've clearly worked a long time for and now are seeing the the fruits of that. And I can tell you from my experience, yeah, like the meetings that come after, yeah, they can definitely lead places. So I'm excited to see where this goes because I, I read the script the other night and I, I really, really loved it. Thank you. Um, yeah, of course. I'd love to talk about about the script a little bit. I don't want to- Yeah, let's do it. Yeah, no, obviously, let's do it, man. I don't want to get too deep into spoiler stuff, obviously, since hopefully this, you know, will, will be on the screen one day. Uh, but like I said, it's about sort of, it's very- it's very lived in and feels very accurate to this sort of lifestyle a child gets into to sort of become great at tennis and how young they would start. And it's felt very either well-researched or lived. Is this anything that you have experience with or is this something you had to kind of dive yeah. into and figure out? That's yeah, a great question. I mean, it's it's a bit of both. I, I grew up playing tennis. I've, I was I started playing tennis when I was like six years old. I, I was in it. I was never... Um, I was never great at it, uh, mm -hmm. but I had a lot of exposure to that world, that lingo, those people, just, you know, every sort of subculture has its own sort of uh, solar system, so to speak. And, and, and I was, I was living in that for a while. And, um, you know, I always wanted to do a sports film and I always wanted to do a film about tennis. I had felt like there had never, tennis had never really gotten its due, Mm -hmm. Obviously, there's King Richard and, mm -hmm. you know, there's the upcoming Challengers film this year with Zendaya, um, which I'm looking forward to. But, you know, when I started writing this in like 2016, it was a while ago. But when I started writing it, you know, there really weren't, you know, these sort of pillars of tennis films. But I wanted it to have a unique angle into it. I didn't just want to write a film that was only for tennis people or only for people who like tennis. I really wanted it to be a film where people could read it or watch it and project their own life onto it, project mm -hmm. their own, you know, b basically the story in essence is about somebody wrestling with their dreams and wrestling with mm -hmm. whether or not it was worth it or is worth it and weighing the pros and the cons. And I feel like we all do that all the time in our lives. Those are like the thoughts that nag at us, that haunt us about, even if you're like trying to be a musician or an architect. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's what I, that was my goal when writing the script is that anybody who's pursuing anything could project their life onto Fahima, the main character. Yeah. And it, and it definitely did. I was going to, that was going to be my next question. I'm still going to find a way to get into it anyway, because I'm not a great interviewer and I don't move on well. Um, but when I read <laughs> it, I, I, it reminded me of something along the lines of like a whiplash kind of thing where it is, yeah sort of about the sacrifices that that pursuing your dreams requires and you mentioned you know how anybody can project their experience onto it and I definitely did you know it's the kind of script that I'm reading and I'm like you know being you know pursuing the industry that we're in it is a very hard path and it, uh, and I it makes you think this script made me think about you know the sacrifices you make the life you didn't lead the choices that you you know, the relationships that didn't work out because you were, you know, this is, no, I'm sorry. This is, I'm, I'm, I, this is more no, this is important. I have, show, no, I get, I, I have a show tonight. This is, I have this is, this is part of our know. flirtation. This is part yeah. of it for sure. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um. So like, it made me, it made me think about that. So how much did you draw from maybe your own experience of like things that you felt like, you know, a life you didn't lead or things you missed out on because, you know, yeah. fuck, I'm going to be a writer, you know? I mean, it's a, uh... I mean, you hit the nail on the head, man. I mean, it it, it it's it comes a a great deal of myself is in it in the sense that, you know, I had always wanted to do film, and then you 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 move out here and sort of you you sort of realize that you're nothing, like you're just like yeah, you know, I, you become a receptionist. I, that's what I became. Mm -hmm. um, you're living in like windowless apartments. Mm -hmm. You know, you're writing draft after draft of things that just aren't any good mm -hmm. and 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 it just any of the glamour the, the the idea of like what it could be it's just reality isn't stacking up to what you expected and uh life's the lifestyle is difficult and so you start to ask yourself like did I make the right choice or am I doing something meaningful I remember thinking in the first few years of living in Los Angeles 
I applied to the Teach for America program. I don't know if you're familiar mm -hmm. with it, but um, I got really far in the interviews. I made it all the way to the final round. And then, you know, a really good teacher of mine from high school who had helped me with a recommendation letter, letter said to me, like, you know, you shouldn't be doing this. Like, mm -hmm. you really need to give your writing and directing career an honest shot. Mm -hmm. um, so anyways, I guess what I'm trying to say is that there is a lot in of me in it in terms of this sort of push and pull. And what I was really trying to be careful of was I didn't want it to just be like, oh, the tennis world is abusive or, mm -hmm. oh, this one coach is abusive. I, you know, I really wanted it to be like this, this sort of real thing where it's like, there's parts of it I really love. And then there's parts of it I really don't love. Mm -hmm. And then, and then you got to make a choice, you know, that's life. Yeah. And I think you accomplished that because I didn't walk away from it feeling like, you know, oh, she just has a bad coach or something about it. it felt like, you know, just a person, this is what it takes maybe right now to be the best at something. And is that what you want to do? And that's, that's, I think you accomplished that really well. I appreciate um, it. I appreciate yeah, of it. Of course, of course. Um, that makes me, I, I also mentioned like you're, you know, being on the blacklist is a huge accolade, but it's not your first accolade. You got into Austin Film Festival and San Diego International with the short film that you wrote and directed. Thank you. Um, yeah, hey, you're welcome. I didn't do it. I didn't, uh, <laughs> I didn't, I didn't select it. For no, I almost never talk about the short film. So even talking with you about it right now is, is, is honestly strange. Um, <laughs> I do my but, research, man. I come, I come at this. I come I'm at a very, this for real. <laughs> yeah, no, you're the real deal. This is the real deal podcast. I'm talking to you, <laughs> Tim Arnold. Listen up. <laughs> so, so school night, I, I, I bring it up right now because I'm trying to, there is a through line, I think, in your voice that I can kind of see between both projects, but they are vastly different. But I'm, before I kind of say what I'm thinking, I want to, I'm curious, like when you describe yourself as a writer and the things that you want to write, how do you sell yourself? How do you say like, this is the, this is the kind of filmmaker that I am? Yeah. I mean, million dollar question, right? I mean, sometimes that changes day to day, but sure. what I generally, what I generally say is that, you know, the movie I'm drawn, I want to make the type of movies that I'm drawn to. And I'm drawn to films that sort of like get inside of you somehow and rattle your bones a bit and you mm -hmm. can't stop thinking about it. Whether or not that comes from either a theme or, you know, some sort of conflict that people can relate to, just it's something that sticks with you. I, I want to make things that are sticky that have a, <laughs> sure. that have like a gooey feeling in them it's, it's hard to describe but um you know that's what I'm aiming for and in, in terms mm -hmm. of what that actually materializes as uh you know I, I like doing everything from different types of genres sports comedy action um mm -hmm. but you know with it, with regards to school night the short film and breakpoint the feature a thing that's similar in them is trying to just sustain a sense of tension, sustain a sense mm -hmm. of um, like never letting the audience go, so to yeah. speak. That's, that's that's kind of what I was going to point to is like what I felt like is kind of the through line because School Night, um, if, if you haven't seen it, I'll do a quick little summary. It's basically uh, a teacher uh, means to send nudes to her husband and sends them to um the wrong person and then how to solve this and it, it becomes immediately high stress and high tension it's a little bit more I think maybe there's a little bit more comedy to it a little bit more cringe comedy than than uh yeah. breakpoint but it has that sense of um of absolute tension that does not let you go so that's I think yeah I think I think you accomplished that I think both of the things that I've seen or read of yours definitely have that feeling so I think you're accomplishing what you're going for thank you yeah just a sense of a sense of tension that feels like it won't let you go and then and then the heart and soul of it sort of peaks out mm -hmm. you know as you go along you know and I'm always afraid of how writing something or making something that feels too sincere too earnest um mm -hmm. but you know ultimately that's what I want to get across oftentimes and so you 
hide it you bury it and <laughs> and 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 tension and um stakes and conflict but um there is something um i don't know i think earnestness has kind of gotten a bad rap since maybe the 90s and 2000s a lot of like just <laughs> just the a lot of cynical comedy a lot of like you know right but i feel like i don't know maybe Ernest is making a comeback like you know they see the ted lassos and the um these kinds I hope of things so. I yeah, hope everything, so. everything everywhere is very earnest i yep. loved it and um you know i mean i i, I don't want to get into spoilers but your blacklist script in the end which i loved Oh, thank you. Has a lot of earnestness to it, but in a really, really well done way. You know, it's like, I don't know. I I, I don't know. I, I don't know if I'm allowed to say anything about it because I know you're you're yeah. trying to get it made. So yeah, there, it's it's another one like the same way. We have to dance around it a little bit because it is, you know, in development right now. But yeah, I earn it. It's basically about uh, I can give like a log line because that was public. Um, this guy who works in sort of a clinic that is doing um, um, end of life care, assisted dying for terminal patients, but it's sort of set in the near future. It's this, and it's sort of, you know, finding a way to give, using like virtual reality, how to give these patients like their perfect endings. And earnestness was, yeah, I was drawn to that. I wanted to, I wanted to get into the emotion in the heart, but find a way I guess, I guess you're right. I think you have to couch it a little bit. You have to, um, you know, I think earnestness peaks out of darkness well, but I guess fully earnest is maybe a little too much for people sometimes. Yeah. But I wish that wasn't the case. I, I wish it wasn't earnest. the case, Yeah, but you do couch it perfectly in yours. I mean, with this whole, the whole end of life care thing is so dark and twisted and funny. And I mean, I feel like that's, you know, we're, we're sort of, I mean, that's so hooky. And I think we're, we we're pulled into it and then you show us the earnestness once we're in the room you know and um, yeah and and it's cool because the, the emotion sort of sneaks up on you that way um i love that i love that in a script where the emotion sneaks up on you and surprises you and you get that sort of like frog in the throat feeling you know because mm -hmm. you're like oh wow that surprised me um like yeah, I, I felt that and i, I felt you... that in your script oh thank you i i i think a script maybe should wear its earnestness on its sleeve, but maybe like under a jacket, you know, like, <laughs> like, so right. you have to, like, you can see the earnestness peeking out when they reach for something. But right. other than that, like, it's, you got to hide it a little bit, I guess. But yeah, everything everywhere is a, another great example of something that, you know, it could just be a wacky, zany action comedy, but the heart at the center of it, I think, is why it's really connecting with people. And I think, um, yeah, I think it's important to to kind of embrace that and not hide from emotion because I think people really respond to to a movie making them feel something. Maybe not Little so. Beach, but another place. <laughs> well, as long as there's talking in it, the robots. <laughs> if the robots don't talk, then I guess that's a no go for the South Carolina clientele. What did you learn making um, <laughs> uh, School Night that took like maybe you're going to take into feature directing or um you know where yeah, whatever yeah, yeah. else you do next your next short or whatever what did I learn gosh I learned so much um you know I, I think I think it's really just about um prioritizing the performance you know sometimes you know you have all of these shot ideas and all of these sort of visual style things that you're trying to cram into a day and oftentimes with short films or even on feature films you're just so limited you're just so constrained but at the end of the day, the thing you really have to protect, I think, is the performance and allowing yourself and the actor to find the moment, calibrate it, and then capture it and not waste that by, um, you know, trying to get that special shot or do that special camera thing. Mm -hmm. um, you know, that's something I kind of already inherently knew, but I, I think it was like a lesson that I had to, you know, learn again like on on set you know mm -hmm. um trying to do this thing or that thing and then the actor or actress saying like can we just focus on on this beat because i i haven't i haven't found it yet mm -hmm. and um you know it's just it's just so true because when you're in the edit it's like you keep returning to your main character's face you keep returning to your protagonist's face and if the 
<laughs> if the reaction, if if the reaction to the moment isn't pitch perfect, the whole thing falls apart. And um, I don't know. I guess that's what I've learned is is prioritizing performance over you, everything else. I like that. I think that makes a lot of sense. And I think, yeah, I think it's easy to fall into the trap of like, I've got my exact storyboards. So I want to do something fancy. I'm definitely going to do a oneer here. But right. you know, it becomes much more. I think I think it's back to the thing of connecting the characters and feeling that emotion and and how we bring that out is definitely the most important thing. Um, you got into two festivals, you got into Austin, you got into San Diego, but it was during COVID era. Did you get to go to either festival or was it all online? Uh, it was all online. We did get into more actually. It's probably okay. not on, you know, we got into Rhode Island International, Aesthetica, which is in England, and then St. Louis International. So it was five festivals total, but it was nice. all, all online. It was all virtual. I had always dreamed of going to Austin you know Austin has sort of that great writers conference mm -hmm. had always wanted to go there but uh no we just did the whole uh networking thing over zoom which you and I are doing a great job with I think this is very fun and flirty but <laughs> I, I you know it wasn't it wasn't you know perfect with uh hundreds of people in a zoom room so to speak. yeah did you make it before the pandemic or did you make it during I meant it I meant it I uh I'm I, I directed it in 2018 okay and then we edited it in 2019 and 2020 when the pandemic happened is when I we started submitting at places gotcha so that's that's a bummer but at least you got some semblance of experience and hopefully you'll get you know <laughs> more festivals and more opportunities to show your stuff um we have about two and a half minutes left. Unfortunately, this thing always flies by. It does. It flew by. It does, doesn't it? Um, but so I want to take give you this opportunity right now. Where can people follow you? Where do you have anything that you want to plug? What am I plugging? <laughs> um, I mean, people can follow me on Instagram and Twitter. Um, what, at what handle? Oh, gosh, I don't. Uh, that's okay. We'll put it I'm in bad, the show notes. I'm bad at this stuff, uh, but um, I'll I should probably put my school night link in my Instagram bio. That way, people can see it easier. <laughs> Maybe I'll do that. But there you um, go. let's see. In terms of plugging something, uh, wanted to go see the extended editions of Lord of the Rings at the Alamo Draft House. Didn't get to. <laughs> oh no! So if anybody out there can go, you should because that's a dream come true. <laughs> I also love to plug things that aren't related to me at all. Um, <laughs> normally I start with this question, but we started off so fun and flirty that I didn't get to, sure, you know, with sure. this last little bit of time, I like to, um, you know, get into these deep questions here. So, you know, the, the sort of premise to this podcast is that I've become a, a hermit in the, in this time and um, don't, and that this has given me an opportunity to, to sort of perform and do comedy like I used to do before I left my, in the days when I actually left my house. How has this time changed you? How is this, this, this guy in front of me different than the one I met years ago? Well, the pandemic happened when me and my fiance were in Costa Rica. So, uh, I'm scared of going on vacation, I guess, that I will <laughs> sure. trigger that I will trigger a worldwide pandemic by going on mm -hmm. vacation. Mm -hmm. um, I had similar thoughts. I was supposed to, I've never left the country, but I was supposed to go to France. My flight was March 2020. Yes, yes, we were, we were, it's we our were fault. in Costa Rica on March 12th. So naturally, I did it. Um, <laughs> but uh, how have I changed? Um spent a lot I'm a lot more of a cat person oh everybody in our writers group are cat people it just seems yeah. to be the case um just because we're awesome I don't know <laughs> <laughs> I always thought I was more of a dog person but then I cat sat recently and I was like no I could I could see this I could see I could see that's the full like evolution from West Virginia to Los Angeles your meeting has ended goodbye <laughs> Thank you for listening to 39 Minute Conversations, hosted and produced by Brian T. Arnold. Music by Kevin McLeod, licensed under Creative Commons by Attribution 4.0 license. If you like what you heard, please subscribe and tune in for new episodes, and don't forget to rate and review. If you didn't like what you heard, please don't do any of that. That's okay, too. Thank you, and we'll see you next time. Stay safe and be well. <laughs>